So let's move on to um, to the tolerant society mm -hmm. and to your um, the development of, of a new perspective, which uh, I presented uh, to the students very very briefly. That through free speech, society learns tolerance. I mean, I'm, I'm summarizing yes. mm -hmm. that very uh, very roughly, and it's almost. Um, you know, people may feel that it's a bit contradictory. Mm -hmm. it, it is not uh, a theory that comes easily. Mm -hmm. So um, ca can you explain a little bit mm -hmm. how you, um, you have come to see free speech from that perspective? Yes. I'm really puzzled about uh, a very particular question. And that question is, uh, why would you take free speech so far? Why would you protect speech that almost everybody thinks is uh, very dangerous, uh, actually very hurtful, harmful in the society? Uh, why would you protect people who are part of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, who want to say racist uh, speech? Mm -hmm. uh, why would you protect neo-Nazis uh, in the Skokie case? Uh, why would you protect people whose mission in life is to overthrow democracy and to abolish freedom of speech? Why would you do that? And the general answers that people give to that uh, question uh, start with uh, search for truth and uh, mm -hmm. democracy uh, as the uh, principal arguments, as we know. And the, the problem with those theories uh, is that they very quickly dissolve uh, when you say, well, why would uh, the search for truth mm -hmm. need uh, racist speech, for example? Why would it need uh, fascist speech, Nazi speech? And when we know, in fact, that uh, these are, have been highly, highly hurtful. Uh, and the answer then is, uh, goes from, well, we need it for the search for truth because it might be true. People then shy away from that and say, I, I, actually, I'm, I'm prepared to accept they not true. And, uh, but the next argument is we need to have false speech in order to test our mm -hmm. true beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was Mill's second yeah. argument in On Liberty, as you know. But even that has a kind of hollowness to it. Why would we want to argue with people who have terrible ideas uh, in order to believe more strongly uh, that those ideas are, are really uh, unacceptable. It doesn't quite ring true. At that point, people slip to a, or move to a third kind of argument. And that argument is, we can't draw lines. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is bad. These are really bad ideas. They're very dangerous, very harmful, very hurtful. Um, Yes, I agree we don't have to really discuss them uh, in order to believe more strongly in, in good ideas. But the fact of the matter is if we ban this speech, we will be on a slippery slope yeah. and we'll ban good speech. Mm -hmm. To me, that didn't account for something that's very powerful. Uh, and that is we celebrate free speech. Mm -hmm. We celebrate the extent to which we take free speech. It starts to say something about us, that we can be in a society where even these very bad ideas can be spoken, and yet we are strong enough. There's something about us mm -hmm. that says this is, uh, this is a source of pride. It's not just a practical accommodation to the inability to no. draw lines. It's in that, that point in the argument, I think, in the discussion, that you begin to realize that we are creating ourselves in the context and through free speech. We've taken an area, mm -hmm. speech, and we are extremely tolerant. Well, if you look at the free speech literature, one of the things that is very prominent is a sense that the natural kind of instinct of people is to be intolerant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it begins to fall into place by taking this one area, speech, by being extremely tolerant in it, we are saying something to ourselves about a general quality we want to have and that's difficult to have, that is to be tolerant, that we need to do that, that applies as much to non-speech behavior as it does to speech mm -hmm. behavior. And there's no longer any need in that stage of understanding 
to make the argument that speech is somehow special, that it's different from everything else. In fact, the fact that it is like other behavior that we deal with is what draws the essence of the meaning out of it. So if you really believe that it's very hard to be a tolerant uh, community, generally speaking, uh, and you look at speech as it's evolved as a place where you are extremely tolerant, uh, from that you can infer that you are actually trying to create a more general quality of mind that I call tolerance. The analogy I use sometimes is wilderness. I mean, we live in a modern urban society, and yet we retain areas mm -hmm. of, uh, of the world that are extremely dangerous and risky. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that is because we think by exposing ourselves to the risks of wilderness, we will change the way in which we think generally. Uh, and there's something about freedom of speech as being protective of a wilderness, but a wilderness of the mind uh, that we need to um, develop in certain ways. What is it about American history that allowed for the birth of that celebration of free speech? How could it become a global uh, phenomenon, a global appeal? Yes. So a very, very hard problem that you've raised, and of course one that both you and I are dedicated uh, to trying to resolve. I think that I would start by saying that just like I described uh, the purpose of freedom of speech as being connected to overcoming something that's natural and that applies everywhere, that really is an insight that's based on an insight into human nature, uh, an assumption about human nature. Uh, and, and another way to put it is that freedom of speech, protecting living in an environment where you speak, other people say different things, some things are uh, hurtful to you and hurtful to others. Uh, freedom of speech as a principle is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. It's not natural. Yeah. And, and so you have to strive uh, for uh, this. And, and I think that's true of, of so many things in life that we value, that we may think of as part of being a civilized uh, world, uh, of having values. Uh, these things don't come naturally. You have to work for them. And uh, in the United States in particular, there have been periods of enormous censorship and yeah. repression uh, and injustices inflicted on people uh, for what they say, for what they think, for what they, how they uh, look, for how they behave, uh, even for people who have done bad things, criminal things, a society can be overly punitive. It can, mm -hmm. uh, so the impulse uh, to be uh, repressive, intolerance, uh, mm -hmm. to censor, is the, in many ways the natural the impulse. Natural. Uh, something, uh, you're right, did happen in the course of the uh, last century in particular in the United States that brought about a, a feeling that, that those kinds of impulses could be dealt with or to some extent addressed through a constitutional norm of freedom of speech. And uh, I, I think I, you know, we can offer various uh, theories for that. Um, I think a sense of stability in the country. Um, um, I think a sense of when there w was instability, uh, the society overreacted in being intolerant. It was then embarrassed by that and developed these principles. Uh, the course of the last century in the United States, just like the century before, but in the last century, is a kind of up and down on mm -hmm. the yeah. uh, course of, of tolerance. Around the world, as you say, we see uh, r rising intolerance, rising repression, but we also see uh, the, the uh, seeds of this uh, general idea of um, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of mind, and tolerance uh, generally 
Uh, and they are in sort of constant yeah. tension, just as they have been in the United States. I think uh, you and I both believe that this is what we're talking about here in terms of a principle. It's not a United States principle. It's not an mm -hmm. American principle of free speech. There's something very much universal in this, and that every culture, every society, every, uh, every peoples, uh, has in their history uh, the uh, uh, development uh, of this notion of these notions of a higher yeah. level of being uh, that they have strived for and our hope is that just um, uh, all throughout the world including the United States but everywhere that uh, these values this way of uh, mm -hmm. being in the world can be achieved in, in your book and I think in your analysis of the United States uh, experience or experiment, um, the, um, the justice system, the judges, have a fairly central role to play. In fact, you, you don't trust the government, you don't trust really the parliament to determine uh, what should be or should not be uh, censored. You think that the um, censorship impulse is far higher with democratically mm -hmm. elected individuals and you put therefore the um, the onus on on the judge to to perform that task and I think it's it's very interesting for many reasons um, one is as you know uh, we are finding that throughout the world the, the judicial system is showing to be quite resilient mm -hmm. to this wave of uh, censorship impulse that we are mm -hmm. witnessing. So can you tell us a little bit more about what makes the judicial system or the judge um, particularly suitable to the task of determining how far we can go in mm -hmm. accepting? It's a very interesting question. If you take everything that we've been talking about as, uh, as true and right, natural impulses uh, to be intolerant, uh, free mm -hmm. speech being used as a way to achieve a, a greater degree of appropriate tolerance, uh, or freedom of speech as a means of serving self-government and, and uh, needing protection, if you, if you accept all that, you then ask, what is the best way to organize a society? Mm -hmm to achieve that. And you're quite right that in the United States, uh, I think it would be a common view uh, that the creation of an independent judiciary uh, assigned the role through the Bill of Rights, through the First Amendment to the Constitution, uh, to implement that gives you a higher degree, a higher chance, a better chance of achieving that openness and, and that, those goals than if you left it to the ordinary government democratic process. That's the, th that's the theory. Now, um, several things to say about this. One is uh, there have been notable uh, instances in which the judiciary did not perform that mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. So when it came to really be tested, uh, the, uh, arguably the judiciary, including the Supreme Court, did not stand up for the role we expected of them. That doesn't mean that's still not the best system, it just yeah. means that it's not a perfect it's, it's system. Not, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the second point I'd make is that uh, if you had asked me in the first part of my career, this question, I would have said it really has been the judiciary and the Supreme Court that has led uh, the society in this direction by developing the principle of freedom of speech and press. Um, I would have said that's because uh, they are uh, educated in this, they have developed a culture yeah. that respects this, their very organization is built around uh, kind of the open mind uh, principle. Um, I would have said a lot of things about how uh, that 
uh, feature of American political and, and legal organization has been critical to developing this principle. I now think that's true, but I'm also uh, puzzling mm -hmm. about whether, in fact, the society itself has come to these norms uh, before the judges Judge. and justices mm -hmm. implemented them, and that they were simply um, reflecting the mm -hmm. values uh, of their time. Um, we will talk, I'm sure, about New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964, that particular period. Very important landmark case in the mm -hmm. development of the First Amendment. Uh, arguably, that was when the court laid down uh, as a very strong principle, the right of free speech uh, pushed to an extreme for self-government. Uh, and yet there are times when I think uh, that was inevitable, that mm -hmm. the court would decide that because the society had yeah. changed so much with national issues and national communications technology, radio and television, uh, that it was, it was really obvious that the court had to do that. So. I'm not at all clear in my mind uh, that a, an independent judiciary charged, assigned with yeah. enforcing this basic value is critical to achieving it. It's not necessarily driving it. I, that it's arguably but it's still, not. it's still important it's in still terms of implementing. No question yeah. okay. it's important.